Hello, everybody. I'm super, super excited. I've got the beautiful, magnetic, magical Shanti back with me today. How are you, Shanti? I'm really good, actually. Thank you so much for having me back with you so often this week. I'm having such fun with you, Bryce. This is I so know, cool. I <laughs> know, I know, I know, I know, I know. I always have fun with you, Shanti. You're like the coolest ever. Like, you're just so freaking cool and you're so wise. And I know our last episode we did, you shared more about your personal life, which we were just saying before we hit record, like such a positive response we've gotten from people from your story and, and, and who you are and how you fell into what you do the magic of who you are and one of your one of your many gifts in this world which is the healing i'm so grateful honestly and i must say i'm overwhelmed by the response as well you know i was saying on um the australia channel the other day you know and um, when we have so many of these 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 overcomers from australia and it's one lady in particular speaking it's so beautiful for me to see the support that these people get from the general public, you know, mm -hmm. and the, there's only nice things to say. I mean, I must say I was overwhelmed by the kindness <laughs> and the, the really the beautiful comments I've been receiving from your viewers as well. So thank you so much, everybody. Mm -hmm. It really is so wonderful when you're sitting up here bearing your soul. Yeah, no, <laughs> right. Today, talking about body dysmorphia <laughs> i know this is gonna be a well this is one that i actually have wanted to talk about for a really really long time and i i couldn't think of a person to do this better uh than with shanti and Catherine was going to join us but she yeah, she doesn't have a whole a lot of uh, ex i guess experience with the body of uh, order, which is <laughs> awesome for her so um because i and i want to put this out here too i'm not a therapist uh, this is just going to be me talking about stuff that i've worked through with my own self of course shanti is a healer so she can come she also can talk about her experiences um with body morphia uh dysmorphia is it dysmorphia disorder i hope this i'm saying it. No, body morphia i hope so <laughs> i mean it's it's a well let's the lay, layman's terms what is body dysmorphia disorder what would that be for the layman's watching right now what what is that <clears throat> Well, let me just start by saying, um, a Carlisle student and I, a number of months ago on my channel, actually spoke about this as well. This is one very young, sassy, gorgeous lady, I want to just say as well. So it's great to be talking about it again. Um, well, body dysmorphia really is, in a nutshell and in layman's terms, is when you have such a distorted view and opinion of the way you look physically that you can look at yourself in the mirror and really think there is this monstrosity looking back at you, yet uh, your friends or your mom or your siblings or whoever will go, what the heck are you talking about? But we really have a distorted uh, vision or an opinion of the way we look physically. So we therefore then go to great lengths to try and change the way we look. I mean, all we have to do is look at how rich plastic surgeons are, right? Yep. And we look at how many women have gone for one surgery after the other, and you look at the way they look after five or 10 or 12 surgeries compared to the way they looked when they before they even went. I mean, I'm amazed that they even think they needed surgery to begin with, you know? Right. Um, I mean, that sort of stuff. So it really is an, a, a distorted opinion or view of the way you look. So you would generally t seem to think that you are a hell of a lot uglier or malformed or disformed, whichever way, whichever the word is, um, in your opinion of yourself than what you actually are. So that's what it is. And I've struggled with this, guys. And there are different extremes of this disorder. And I haven't, I know I was doing a little bit of reading before we signed on about it. And there are people that literally can't leave their house because they're so horrified by how they perceive themselves to look. I was never that bad, but I did. I, I struggled. Um, I have struggled a lot with uh, what I would see in the mirror wasn't what other people would see and it's a psychological thing and i know for me um i, I could probably tra trace it back to my childhood um you know i know that uh, my my mother's mother was uh gorgeous and so i know that there I, I remember my mother saying once and i hope my mother doesn't mind me saying this that when she was growing up it was hard 
because her mother was so gorgeous. And so there was always that lingering. My grandmother was awesome. Like I wasn't, she wasn't like this bitchy, gorgeous person. She was a, a beautiful human being. Um, but she was known for her beauty. And, um, even she died when I was eight. So she's been dead for 21 years now, but even before she was very young, she's 61 when she passed away of cancer. But even in my twenties, when I would go back to their town, people would stop me. And one of the things they would say was, Oh, your grandmother, Maxine was so beautiful. They would, people would talk about it. And so there's that lingering, um, understanding of value and beauty, which I don't think that's what they meant. I think it was just a compliment. Um, and then of course, uh, in my twenties, I, when I lived in my twenties, I got to the point when I lived in Los Angeles that I would weigh myself every single morning, I would weigh myself. And if I got over like 110 pounds, I would freak out. And then on my 27th birthday, I realized that this was becoming a problem and I've never been really overweight. Like I've never, it, it just, it psychologically, there was such a, a me beating myself up that at 27, I threw my scales away and I have not weighed myself since. And I'm 39 now. And so that was part of cutting that chain. And, um, and another thing I, I, you know, for me, I've struggled with, and I'll be very vulnerable here with my breast. Um, I'm, I'm again, I'm not that big of a person, but I have my breasts are like a D, a D cup and I've wanted to have a breast reduction for a long time and I don't really need one. And it wasn't until recently I was telling you off, off camera, Shanti, we were kind of talking about exercises we do. And just recently I've been doing the exercise of sitting in front of the mirror and just looking at myself naked and actually complimenting myself and going, you know what? Women pay good money to have breasts my size. And look at that. You're 39 years old and you've got a flat stomach. Like, look, at you know, and it's and just really starting to, to, to correct the language that I use around my own self, because you said something yesterday in our episode, like the way we speak to ourselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if a absolutely. man spoke to me that way, that would be considered abuse. Absolutely. Absolutely. We, 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 we're, we're our own greatest narcissist, aren't we? And uh, that's why I said if, if, if a man ever spoke to me in the way that I spoke some of my thoughts <laughs> to myself, I would be mortified. I would, I would never forgive it, honestly. But at the end of the day, that really is a lesson for us because, you know, you also spoke just going back a little bit about your grandma and I had the same thing. I mean, my grandmother was 36 years old and my grandpa uh, came back from the second world war and he passed away. So she was this young, beautiful Jackie Onassis kind of lookalike, um, 36 years old. And we lived, of course, in a small community and driving around in a little sports car type thing. And, of course, then suddenly all her friends turned on her because now all their husbands were interested. Now we're going back a number of years. We're interested in my grandma, you know, which was a big problem. My mother was extremely beautiful. Um, and still is. I mean, she's 82. You would never even think that. And she's always taken care of herself. But I remember one of the things um, for me as a child, the one time that I loved being with my mom, she, she had a very, she had a morning and evening skin routine. And I used to watch her every morning and every, well, not so much the evenings, but the mornings. I used to stand there and I used to watch her do whatever she was doing on her face, you know? And she always said to me, it's as important to be beautiful, as beautiful on the inside as what you are on the outside. So for me, that was something very important, but she was, I mean, she was a Miss Queen this and a Miss Queen that when she was young, you know? Um, and she was very well known in our areas to be the, the most beautiful woman in the community. And I always said my father was the six foot six gentle giant. He was the biggest, most handsome guy. My mother was the most beautiful. I had my life made. <laughs> so, yes. And I remember as teenagers as well, um, four girls we were, and I was the youngest of the four. And my mother was always deemed one of the sisters. She, you know, she just had a natural, youthful demeanor about herself, still does. And she was looked as you know looked like one of the sisters however um my father being of dutch descent much taller and obviously very very big burned um 
well, I did. And my other sisters, yes and no, you know. But I certainly took after that with a larger frame and prone to pick up weight. So when I was in my teenage years, definitely, and I was a tennis player, so I was always on the tennis court and wearing short skirts and things like that, you know, and I was a tennis player. And I just remember starting to pick up weight when I was probably about 16, 17 years old. I hated it. I hate, and, you know, I was at a co-ed school with boys and then they started teasing me and they started calling me names, you know, to do with my weight and stuff like that. I want to tell you, I still, I still think about those days and it still burns the pit of my belly. So I want to just say to anyone who's watching right here and right now, if you ever shame, body shame, or if you're one of those people who are body shaming someone else, I don't care how old you are, just don't. Just don't. Because it is such an impactful thing to do, and especially when the person is young and impressionable, you know. Um, but then I, I you know, um, when I fell pregnant with my son, and I had huge boobs. I had huge boobs. <laughs> I had such big boobs. I'm like, no. <laughs> anyway, and when I fell pregnant with my son, I was a young mother. Um, I had him when I was 21. It was the craziest thing because while I was pregnant, I only gained, was it six or six and a half kilos? And I didn't try and I wasn't, wasn't like I was going on a diet or anything. I didn't, I was eating, but I then decided I wasn't going to get, gain 20 or 30 kilos while I was pregnant, but I was going to just eat more healthy. And I must say that's when my healthier life thought lifestyle definitely came into play for me while, while, was while I was pregnant. I remember eating a lot of fruit, but I craved fruit and I craved veggies. And I, I craved lemons, lemons and, and vinegar. It was like, I just couldn't get enough of that. So um, by the time I had him, when I had him, I'd actually lost six or seven kilos. Now I gained four and a half kilos at full term. And when I had him, I lost, I think, six or seven kilos when I put myself on the scale. And my breasts just shrunk. It was the craziest thing. So I was kind of like going in the reverse of everyone else. And since then, I must say, I, I, wasn't, I, I, I wasn't as um, round, full-figured <laughs> as what I was then. But I always carried extra weight and definitely went through stages where I was more overweight um, and I never liked my body, yeah. ever, 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 ever. I want to tell you never. People would tell me I, I look good and especially in that I have good legs and what have you. You just compliment me and I would just lash out at you like, what do yeah. you want from me? I mean, if someone gave me a compliment, if a man gave me a compliment, I thought, well, what do you want? I'm not going to screw you. Excuse my language. But that was my mind that the only reason that people actually ever complimented me was because they wanted to go to bed with me. That was it. Yeah. And it was like, you stay the F away from me. And I, because, and I, I sort of became completely the opposite. Instead of embracing that and enjoying that and maybe enjoying the, the roundness, the more voluptuous aspect of, and I wasn't, I mean, I want to say I was never huge or anything, yeah. but um, instead of embracing the voluptuousness and, and, and rocking it the way that the voluptuous girls do nowadays, but bearing in mind, I grew up in the eighties. Okay. There you, ha you couldn't be thin enough. You couldn't be brown enough. Your bikini couldn't be small enough and you couldn't be wearing enough sun, 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 suntan lotion, the shiny one, <laughs> the one that made yeah. you shout out the the oil. And smell like coconuts or coco pina colada. <laughs> you, it's so funny you say that because I, I have the same re Well, so it's weird because I don't know if this is culturally for me. I have this memory. So my dad's family, kind of like your dad's family, they're all really tall. Like uh, my grandfather was six, five. My dad's like six, three, six, four. I have a great aunt who was six feet, um, really tall. And I remember I have this memory. Uh, I was probably eight, nine, 10 years old. And we would have this babysitter that would come babysit us when my parents would go out for the night. And this memory is like ingrained in my head and I'll, I'll 
tell you guys why, how this has to do with body dysmorphia for me in a minute, but every time it got close to the time of my parents coming home, this babysitter would go put a bunch of makeup on. And one time I remember sitting on the, uh, the edge of the bathtub in the bathroom while she was putting her makeup on. I remember asking her like, why are you always putting makeup on before my parents come home? And she responded to me because your dad is really hot. And I remember like this, like really like, just like, you know, that's your dad. So I remember being like, Oh, that's so gross. Like, like that's like so gross. Um, but it, it's like ingrained in my head. And then growing up in, in the South, there's such this like Stetford wives type of, um, culture where like my mother would have been horrified if or she was horrified once when I went to the grocery store in running clothes, you know, always wear lipstick and mascara. But what started to happen to me as I got into my teenage years and into my twenties was anytime anyone gave me a compliment about my physical appearance, especially a man, it would put a lot of pressure on me. I felt like I then had to live up to this expectation every single time or I would not be enough. It was like the mm. way I looked was the most in, in my mind. Now, when I say this, it's silly because I don't look at other people that way. And with partners, like I've never looked at a man and been like, oh, you have a little bit of a belly or, oh, no, this is wrong. No, never. It's the essence of the person. I, I you know, it's, it's not a, I've never had that type level of scrutiny on a man, but I always put it on myself. And yeah. again, yes, anytime I would get these compliments about anything physical, it would like really stress me out because all of a sudden there was an expectation to always look a certain way, to always be a certain way. And, um, and, and it's, it's, it's took a lot of, or taken a lot for me, a lot of like self-study and really sitting with that in order to even try to process it. And I think the thing with uh, this dysmorphic disorder is that it never really goes away. It's always kind of there, but it's learning yeah. to, like you were talking about yesterday with the healing, learning to use it to kind of Absolutely. rise above it. Absolutely. You know, definitely. And I think also, you know, in my teenage years, we were, I was at boarding school. So, um, obviously having a bunch of girls together in the hostel. Um, I remember we were always on diet. Yeah. We were always weighing ourselves. We were always, I remember buying pants that were a size too small for me so that I could particularly diet and fit into them. Yep. Come the time of the school social or dance or whatever it was. And to me, I remember thinking so clearly, if only I was thin, my life would be perfect. In my mind, thin girls were happy girls, you know. I remember that thought was so stuck in my head that I, to this day, I remember it like it was yesterday. And it certainly took me a while to get through that. And as I, I must say, when I met Hannes, who was my, my Austrian fi fiancé, um, I was 24. And I remember him just looking at me, thinking I was amazing. And I, I would say, I would say, no, don't look at my big hands. He'd say, you don't have big hands. You've got the most beautiful, strong hands. I'd say, don't look at my big feet. He'd go, oh, those are beautiful feet. Look at your toes. He said, I've never seen toes like that. And wow, you, your feet are in such good condition. Like he's never seen a woman with such nice feet. He said, you are strong. He said, you are strong. And suddenly that shifted so much for me, for, from me to suddenly, because I'm 5'9", I'm 1.75, which is not abnormally tall at all. I've also got a six foot sister and a 5'11 sister, you know, um, and definitely. And, but my father, I remember when we were teenagers, he, he would say to us, um, you are beautiful. No daughter of mine will walk with her shoulders hunched. He would insist we walk with Tasha. He said, pull in your tummy and push out your boobs. And that was, that was my father's, what he would say to us. So, you know, even though we had that from him, but I also know my dad, he did not enjoy anything that was fat. I remember that completely. Although he never, ever body shamed us. I just felt it in my being. And when I picked up weight, 
there was a critical eye on me. Whether I'm right or wrong to this day, I don't know, but that was my perception of it. Yeah. Um, you know, so there was never a physical talk around it, but I also remember, I remember my mom always watching her weight. So there was just this whole emphasis on the way you looked. And that, I definitely believe that was very much an 80s thing. And I think anyone who was a teenager or sort of grew up in that era will, will probably concur with me there. But honestly, when I then, when I was with Hannes, my perception of myself changed a lot. I felt more confident. I felt loved. I felt appreciated. And that's when my confidence in myself grew as well as a person, just to be valued and appreciated by another human being, the way that he valued and appreciated me did a lot for my confidence. And then I, I definitely wasn't skinny then if we were talking weight or whatever like that, but I still liked just feeling better about myself. And, you know, as I went along on my healing journey and as I understood more about what my body truly is and how to appreciate why I chose my body to look the way I do, because, you know, I truly believe we choose the way we look as well. You know, our spirit is what it is before we incarnate onto this beautiful planet. We choose to look the way we do. Definitely. We choose to have the issues that we do. And it didn't take me long into my healing journey to understand and realize that I chose exactly this. I chose to be this. And then I could start looking at myself differently. And I know I'm certainly not one of those people who's going to appear on a Vogue cover. No, I don't want to appear on a Vogue cover. My beauty comes from a very, very different place. It's an essence within me. And it took me a long time to come to terms with who I've been in past lives, okay, because I had to come to terms with that and not want to hide that anymore because I was scared of jealousy. And all. I mean, if I look at my astrology chart, it explained a lot. So then when I made peace with all of that, and it wasn't about even who I was in past lives, because I really don't even agree with looking at that because it's who I am now. But I understand that there were past life stuff that came, that was playing itself out in yeah. this lifetime. And I had to make peace with those aspects of myself before I could fully enjoy the experience of being Chantel. And now I love being me. Honestly, I wouldn't want to be anyone or anything else. I don't say I don't have a bad day and what have you, but I've lost all the ex excess weight that I've needed to want or uh, without being on diet. I never go on diet. I don't know when last I weighed myself. Um, I started doing stuff like yoga and pole, pole fitness. Um, that for me, I've got to say as well, when you start doing stuff like that, it gives you a certain level of confidence within yourself as well. Yeah. So for me, just to wear my booty shorts, go to yoga, hop on the pole with other three or four girls in the studio, no one really cares what you look like. We're all just enjoying the experience of doing, um, you know, pole fitness, which was quite challenging. And that, was a beautiful experience you know I don't I also taught it for a while I don't anymore but it was just stuff like that you know yeah. that really got me to appreciate who I am and yes I'm way into my 50s I've got a flat belly I've got strong legs I've got strong arms I've got a strong back I'm who I am I've got wrinkles on my face I don't go for jabs and I'm very happy <laughs> I definitely don't want to go for the <laughs> Well, it's so funny because we've talked about this. So in my journey, I, because I was born in 1983. So I came rolling into this world in the jazzercise, in the low fat, in that world. And I do believe that greatly affected my perception of things because my mother would do the Richard Simmons videos and the Jane Fonda's and she had the firm and she was constantly exercising. And there is a positive. I think my sister and I were very much influenced that exercise was an, a necessary part of life for health purposes. But I saw my mother going to the Weight Watchers meetings. In fact, I, my favorite thing from a memory 
of going to a Weight Watchers meeting with my mom as a kid, like sitting against the wall coloring, was it was right before Thanksgiving here in America. And um, I remember the leader said, now remember, if you gobble, 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 you wobble, wobble, wobble. And I still remember that to this day. If you gobble, 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 you wobble, wobble, wobble. I was, I was a kid. I was like sitting in the back. <laughs> That's like my memory for Weight Watchers. That is so rude. <laughs> so I still, and every Thanksgiving, I'll say that to my mom. I'll be like, remember, if you gobble, 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 you wobble, wobble, wobble. So... Um, but oh it, my goodness. it was always such a part of our life. And my mother came from a, a family of four girls. My sister and I were two girls. My dad had two sisters. And so there was a hell of a lot of girls around us, you know, and, uh, and it wasn't until my cousin Will was born that there was actually a boy that was born. I don't think anybody knew what to do with him because all of a sudden here's a boy, but, um, <laughs> Uh, so it was a lot of like estrogen. Everybody's always on diets. Everybody's, you know, down here, uh, we have the Spanx, which is like a girdle you can wear to keep your tummy in and all that kind of stuff. But I, I, in my early, well, in high school, I ran cross country and then I was running up all through my twenties and I overdid it. I got to the point where I over exercised because I was punishing myself. There was a punishment there. And looking back, there was no need for that because it wasn't like I had done anything wrong or like I was overweight or anything like that. But it was like this indoctrinated need that exercise was punishment. Exercise meant you had to fit into a certain size. Exercise meant this. You were not a good person unless you actually went through this. And when I lived in Los Angeles, I was running and I, uh, and I found yoga around that time too. So it was kind of this like both happening, but I was running out in Los Angeles and I, I felt something in my foot and I just kept running. I had to keep running. And it ended up fracturing a bone in my foot in Los Angeles. And I remember going to the doctor and the doctor was like, you are overdoing it. You are overdoing it. Your body is breaking. And that was the yeah. first time I'd ever had that realization that you could actually overdo it on your body. And that's when it yeah. actually prepared me more into yoga at that point. But now, and, and I really hope as we move into this new timeline that things like, cause exercise is such a magical thing to do if you do it right. If you're Absolutely. doing it to learn your body, to learn, feel the energy flow, to learn where all these magical places are inside of you that are activated by heat and sweat and contraction of muscle, not because you're punishing yourself to fit into a skinny gene or to be loved by a man, you know, and I know for me, the men mm -hmm. I've been with in my life, they weren't judging me as hardly as I was judging myself. You know, yeah. they weren't, they weren't looking, I mean, I never got kicked out of the bed. Let's just put it that way. So, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. so exactly. it was all me to myself. And now as a teacher, you know, especially I'm sure you see this Shanti with, with students and clients, I see that in people, especially women. I know men, I know men do struggle with this as well, but for, especially women, I see that sorrow of self, um, self hatred. Yeah, and, and it's, it's absolutely it's heartbreaking to see that you know bryce you were mentioning and i think we've spoken about that before but you know in part of my our mentorship programs and really and and this this is all of the all of the stuff that i teach has never been taught to me by someone this is knowledge that I, i've had from within and has also been part of my journey and because i've had such issues with my body um in my younger years, part of the assignment is that they have to take time and look at themselves naked in the mirror, spend time with that. Do you know, and especially, okay, let me start by saying that I'm surprised how many men, because I've quite a few men going through my programs as well, have had, also have body issues with themselves. It's amazing, you know. I also kind of had the perception that men don't have issues with their bodies. It's just women. But definitely, especially women. Um, women, for example, would, would, would have, after having three kids, and now their breasts aren't the same as what they were when they were 16. And I mean, I've constantly heard, well, I don't look the same as what I did 10 years ago, and my belly this and that. And the whole thing is, is not you know, you're looking at that. So you've got to shift your perception. 
So instead of seeing your boobs as now being these, I don't know, whatever you see them as, I don't want to say those nasty things that people say about their breasts. It's like, well, these breasts fed my children. You know, had it not been for them, my children would not have been nurtured and fed and healthy, happy little kidlings today. You know, in your belly, you that's where you carried your children. You got your stretch marks. Your stretch marks are your badges of honor, you know. And, oh, I've had a scar there in this operation. I'm going, that scar saved your life, you know. So instead of looking at your thighs and thinking, well, there's way too much hail damage or, what, or, or whatever on there, no, those thighs, those legs carry you forward. So instead of looking at it in a critical way, we start appreciating the function of the body because without this body, you could not express who you are on this planet. This is a third dimensional planet. We come here in our beautiful meat suits. Yes, we need to. We can't be little flouncy puffs of golden spirit on this earth. No one would see you, right? You'd get very frustrated. I see, I see, I see deceased ones that are hovering here and they get very frustrated because they can't be seen anymore. Trust me, you need a body. And even though, yes, is your body a temporary vehicle? Of course it is. But by gosh, it's the most beautiful, intelligent vehicle you could ever possess. So instead of seeing it as this horrible, ugly thing that doesn't deserve anything nice, you got to start learning how to appreciate, appreciate your 10 flexible fingers, appreciate your elbows that have movement, appreciate your legs that carry you forward. And even if you have a missing limb or something, appreciate the experience and the gift that this experience of having a missing limb is giving you. What is it teaching you? So, there, you know, there's always a flip side to this coin. And when we start appreciating our body for what it truly is and the purpose it fulfills and that it is the manifestation of your spirit, your body is your spirit in physical form. And without this body, you could not express and you could not fulfill the purpose of your soul. That is it in a nutshell. And when that sinks in, you will start looking at your body in a very different way. Appreciate your eyes that see, your ears that hear, your nose that smells. You know, instead of wanting to run off to the plastic surgeon and have your whatever, I don't know what people do. I mean, look, I can appreciate if you've got a definite malfunction and, and it's really holy for sure. Then go and have it sorted out if that makes you feel better. Yeah. But just for... Uh, cosmetic reasons, I would think twice. I would, it's such a beautiful way of coming into self-acceptance. And I'll tell you, my body is so not perfect because in this life, I've so needed to learn self-acceptance without the help of a knife or a slice or a liposuction, whatever. Your body will naturally, when you love and appreciate who you are, your body naturally finds its form. Yeah. And in the way that it is, but it occurs within the mind and the spirit first. You've got to find that alignment within your spirit first, and then the body follows suit. So I, when I was uh, in the shower this morning, um, thinking about this show we were going to do today, and I looked down, I was watching the water run over my body, and I was looking down at my stomach and you know, I have lines for abdominal, like my core is strong, and but I have a scar going across my stomach from my appendicitis I had when I was 12. But you're right, that scar shows that I survived. I have a scar on my back from surgery I had when I was 17. That scar shows I survived. I have a scar on my left butt cheek that we talked about from a brown recurse spider. Spider man. That spider shows I survived. I have two scars on these fingers. I have a scar going across this finger, these two fingers right here, because when I was a little kid, I was getting out of, we were going to get a Christmas tree and I was getting out of my dad's truck and I was holding on to the railing and my sister slammed the door, not knowing my hand was there and I have two scars there. But when I see that now, it kind of makes me laugh because it brings me back to a very happy time of childhood. And those scars yes. 
remind me of of that time of childhood. I was lucky to have your fingers. And I saw my fingers, and I can hold this over my sister's head for the rest of our lives. No, <laughs> I have a scar on my ear. It's you can kind of see it right here. I had a hunk of my ear that had to be cut out when I was in high school because it was precancerous. And but they caught it and they took it out. And that little scar reminds me that. I survived, you know, and exactly. I was, and I was looking wow. at the muscle marks of, and I was thinking about at 39, like the life I've lived, I've traveled the world. I've been everywhere. And this body is what brought me through that. The, the amount of, even though I've abused it, I've run it to the ground. I've, I've broken bones. I've done all that stuff. It still is here with me and it's functioning. And, and it's, it, it also carries all the mole molecular information for my ancestors. And it's like so does. our ancestors it's were so all does. of us. Our ancestors were survivors, and we carry that with that magic within us. It's Do you know? And I mean, our bodies are so forgiving. I mean, our cells are constantly renewing and reproducing themselves. You know, if you, for example, I mean, if we just look at the liver within the body, and the liver is, is the solar plexus. Uh, it forms. Uh, it's one of the organs that belong to the solar plexus, which is all about your personal power or not. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the liver is, if we look at, for example, in the Western world, one of the, one of the poisons that we tend to abuse the most is alcohol, right? Because it numbs something. And in the liver is where we store our anger, right? So when we keep drinking, it's not the addiction that we should be looking at. It's the source of the addiction. So that would, and, and if we look at the, the, the alcohol will often mostly, and not only, but I'm just, just pinpointing something here now, the, the organ most affected would be the liver. And yet when we decide to say, okay, I no longer choose to drink. I'm not choosing to, to take responsibility for my emotions or for the things that are causing me pain and that are making me angry because angry and sad are good friends. Yeah. They're best friends. So, what is making me, and I always say anger is a mask for fear or pain. So when we start looking at that anger, uh, we take away that mask. What is the fear and what is the pain that is driving that anger? And <clears throat> that's often going to be sitting in the liver. And the liver is so forgiving. Unless you've really, really, really hammered it, hammered it, hammered it, hammered it, hammered it, hammered it. But you will, you know, when you decide, okay, I'm choosing to do it differently now. I'm choosing to cut the crap and the toxins and not just from the alcohol, but from the bad foods and everything that I'm ingesting at the same time, I'm choosing to have my two liters of water a day, stuff like that. You will be amazed at how forgiving your organs are. They will, they start dancing. Every little cell in your body starts taking on. And let me tell you, cells are listening. Your cells are the most intelligent, beautiful they have, a, they have a consciousness of their own. Yeah. So when you start keep telling yourself how ugly you are, how hideous you are, how fat you are, how, how you don't like yourself, your body is going to respond accordingly and give you more of what you you telling it. But the minute you start turning that around and start saying, wow, I just, I really appreciate my liver. I really appreciate my bladder for the function it, 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 it fulfills, my heart, my lungs. Because if you look at your car, right, I mean, it can look all nice and shiny on the outside. So we can do all the makeup and the da 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 put in full. I mean, I saw the other day, I was mortified, these little influencers, all of 21 or 22, having these fake teeth put in. It's like, oh, my goodness, what's going to happen when you're 40? Whatever, yeah. you're going to not have any teeth in your mouth, you know? So it's just like stuff like that. But when you, you, you so need to look at what's inside. So open up the bonnet or the, what you guys call the hood of your car and look at the engine, Do you, you know? Without that, your car wouldn't go, no matter how shiny the outside, right? Right. So it's the same with our internal organs and our insides. So we, when we start understanding whatever we put in, is what we're going to get out. Yeah, absolutely. And at some point, and at some point, sure. Um, sorry, my laptop is um, there. There we go. <laughs> no, I and it's so funny. Like I, I eat very healthy, and it's not 
because it's anything to do with some stereotype of being a yoga practitioner or anything like that. It's because when I eat healthy, when I eat plant-based and for my dosha, it's like magic. I feel better. My body responds in a very magical way. And I, my colon works better. You know, if you want, yeah, if you've ever constipated people are typically not happy people, you know, like that stomach to have it functioning, not that women do that or anything, but (laughs) (laughs) yoga people only talk about our, you know, colons and periods and (laughs) so. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's a normal, it's a normal functioning part of the body. And let's think about that because that's all about letting go, right? Your colon, your bowel, all of that. And when people have the IBS and bowel issues and what have you, what shit have you not let go of? And I'm sorry, I didn't mean to be, didn't mean to be graphic and gross. Yeah. But that is exactly what it is. Your body will constantly be talking to you. And if you start listening, you're going to have a very different body experience. Really, really, really. It's just a beautiful thing when you start appreciating your body and no longer looking at the external. Yes, of course, I like to wear makeup, okay? I like to do my hair. I'm a girly girl, believe it or not. I'm a real girly girl. But at the end of the day, it means nothing when I'm not feeling good about who I am. So it's just, it's something I like to, I like to take care of myself. I like to take a shower twice a day. I like to, you know, I like to um, paint my toenails. I like to go for a massage. I like all these things, you know, but at the end of the day, it's really about how I'm feeling about myself because if the internal organs are not functioning properly, there's nothing that, that, that is going to change. I mean, we all know what it feels like to be in pain. When you're in pain, you can't meditate. When you're feeling uncomfortable, it's just like the most hideous thing. You walk around looking glum, your energy is low, you look flat, you know. And I'm amazed at how many people actually live in that constant cycle of not feeling good. I People who drink every day, I'm amazed at how normal it becomes for them. And how normal it becomes to wake up with a hangover or, or it becomes part of their life. And the minute they stop doing that, it's like their whole life changes. And if we just look at also how the beauty industry cashes in on our vanity, external vanity, that is. Isn't that- yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. And that's really because the beauty industry predominantly is about our insecurities. Yeah, they play on that. And like your life's going to be so much better. But you're right. And it's so funny. So my grandmother, who was this beauty queen, would often tell my mother when my mother would be frustrated, well, if you can't change your looks, change your personality. Because at the end of the day, the personality, the essence of who you are, and we spoke about this, I think before, like I think on when we were talking about the affair of the poisons about you know, when you're initially attracted to someone, yes, there is, I, I have a type, there's a type of man that I'm attracted to, but at the end of the day, it's the essence of that person that really attracts me. Um, and it's not, it has nothing to do at that point with whether they have a little bit of a beer belly or, you know, exactly. whatever, you know, it's, it's in, in, it, cause in body's always changing as well, but it's, we were talking about this 10 flexible toes. When I was a little girl, my mom's family is from the coast of South Carolina. So we would always go in the summer times with my mom's sisters and we would stay there and, and all the, we'd stay on the beach and we would have like this live-in babysitter that was with us, you know, so that our parents could, you know, not have to worry about the kids. But, um, Miss Linda, one of our babysitters used to always do this little rhyme with us. She would say, I have 10 little fingers, 10 little toes, two eyes, a mouth, and a nose. Put it all together. And what do you got? You got me, babe. And that's a lot. And she would have us <laughs> say that every single morning. We all eight of us, all eight of us would sit on the stairs and we would do the, the rhyme with her every single morning. And I, was like, I love that. Yes. That is so cool. I think you got to write that out for us, Bryce. I think you got to make a little picture and put it on here for us. Uh, I'll see if I can find a picture of all of us sitting on the stairs. <laughs> we have so many pictures of us. Most of the times we got little baby butts because we just run around naked, all eight of us. But um, but um, <laughs> yeah, she would do that. And, and I guarantee you all of my cousins um, and my sister, so the seven other kids involved in that, I guarantee you they all remember that. 10 little fingers, 10 little toes, two eyes, a mouth and a nose, but 
it all together. What do you got? You got me, babe. And that's a lot. You know, I'm sure my sister says that to her kids now. And that was Miss Linda. Miss Linda, every single morning, that's how she started our morning off. And, and, and that is beautiful. Fine. Kudos to Miss Linda. What a beautiful I know. thing to do for kids. Yeah, yeah Ms. and Miss Linda, she was a, a breast cancer survivor like yourself. And I remember she had um she had one of her uh, breasts removed, and she had would wear a fake uh, a fake replacement. But she was so del- it's almost like she probably I'm so, I don't want to speak for her. I was young, but it seems like looking back, she had gone that probably had brought her through a lot of transformation as well, her own battles. And so the fact that she took that responsibility to really start that every day with us. Now, Shanti, you were saying you, you kind of do this with your courses where you have people look in a mirror and, and, and I was going to challenge people to do that. Cause I've been doing that with myself. You don't have, no one else has to be around. It's just you. I did it this morning after I showered, I literally sat in front of the mirror naked and like told myself positive things. And I was literally Absolutely. like, you're 39 years old and you look better than some 27 year olds. Good job. Absolutely. You know, like just, yeah absolutely and so is that a good place for people to start if, if they're like us and they've started yes, i would i would definitely say the first thing you do is you when you get into the shower and when you get into the bath just as you're washing your arms thank your arms for hugging and holding as you're washing your legs your legs that carry you forward your feet that keep you strong and stable your breasts that fed your children, your belly that held your your children, your back that is strong and supportive, your eyes that see, your ears that hear, or if you're putting lotion on your body, you know, use that time for positive affirmation as opposed to what you look like or what you think you look like, okay, and use it for appreciation of the function of what each and every part of your body does. You know, anyone who's had arthritis or something yeah. would, would absolutely appreciate holding the steering wheel, something that a normal person that doesn't have that takes so for granted. Yeah. You know, the fact that you can move your neck around. Have you ever had a stiff neck? My gosh, I'm yeah. one of these fortunate people, really. I've seldom had pain in my body. But man, oh man, there, on the occasions that I do, I can so, like a sore back or a pinched nerve. Can you imagine someone walking around with excruciating back pain the whole time? And if you are one of these people who have constant pain in your body, then I want to say this to you. Pain is not there to crush you or to kill you. It is there to take you to a deeper level of awareness. So what I mean when I say that is that which part of your body is the pain in? If it's in your back, what does your back mean? Let's think about the back. It's the support in your body, right? Your spine supports. Your back is all about supporting you. So where do you feel unsupported? Yeah. That's the first question you ask yourself. Is it your husband or your wife or your parents or your children or your whatever that is not supporting you? Well, then I want to say to you, the minute we're blaming someone, it's very, very, very unproductive. And to blame someone is probably the most, one of the most harmful things you can do to yourself. So then I'm going to say to you, it all comes back to me. So bring it back to myself and say, where am I not supporting me? Now, it might, you might, you know, if you're not getting child support for four of your children, it doesn't mean that you, it's not that literal. What I'm saying is maybe you unsupporting, you're being unsupportive of yourself in the thoughts you're thinking and yeah. the thoughts you've always thought. Where do you think? God or your creator or your source is not supporting you. Are you having quiet time? Are you praying? Are you meditating? Are you asking yourself within what the solutions are? There's a solution for everything. If you have any form of cancer, cancer is always trauma-based, always, 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 always. And if you're a child, well, that's a different thing, but we can talk about that in another day because that's very often generational and that would be a different type of 
but I'm talking about a, a, a grown person. I'm not expecting a child to be watching, although you, maybe one of your children does have something like that. But if that's the case, I'd rather speak to you off air, not, not, this, not, not on this platform. But cancer is something that is trauma-based. In my situation, I had it in my right breast. Right is the masculine side, left is the feminine side. Breasts are nurturing. Your breasts are all about nurturing, okay? You nurture the children. Your, your babies drink. Whether you had kids or not is immaterial. They're about nurturing. So I was very angry because I felt unnurtured by males in my life when I had that. And when I clicked in, do you know that within 24 hours, the lump went to half its size? Wow. I believe it. Half I believe it. Yeah. And every single time. And then what happened, it would come and go for somewhere between four to six months. And every time it came up, I knew there was going to be an issue around masculinity or my own masculinity within my life, because I'd also felt, you know, um, I was a single mom. My, my, the father of my son never supported financially, emotionally or anything. So I felt I had to be mom and dad. So it wasn't like my child got to see his dad on weekends and stuff like that. I was single parenting and I was definitely too masculine with my child because my child is super smart and he's super stubborn and he's super from when he was cave. I mean, he was 10 days old and he was laughing. Okay. Laughing. So he was one of these that was a very quick developer and what have you. So he kept me on my toes. So unfortunately, what I did, if I was giving him instruction, I immediately went into man mode. You better do this. If you don't do that, then this, you know, instead of dealing with him differently. That brought out a different aspect of his personality. So in hindsight, I can see many things that I went wrong, for example. But that, what I'm saying, that was one of the reasons why I had this. I was very angry about that. I felt uh, betrayed. I felt like I had to do it all on my own. And it made me not trust men. It, it was just a, a whole big. And of course, when you don't trust a man, what happens? You attract men that can't be trusted. Exactly. <laughs> yes. Yes. It becomes that self-fulfilling prophecy, right? And right. Just, oh, you know, eventually I got it. So what I'm saying is everything in your life, there's a, there's, a, there's a core issue around that. Now, you need to support your body on four levels, spiritually, emotionally, mentally, and physically. So that's the four legs of the table. So you would definitely then want to look at making sure all four legs of your table are equally balanced. That one leg is not taking 50% of the weight, the other one, nothing, you know, and then you're wobbling around. You've got to have 25, 25, 25, 25. Yes. That's the first thing you want to be doing. So the first thing is to acknowledge and take responsibility for whatever's wrong in your life or in your body. Take responsibility that you have created this. Am I saying you need to blame yourself? Hell no. There's no blame here. There's no blame. We don't blame ourselves. We don't blame each other. We just take responsibility for the fact that my choices in my life have taken me to this point. Now, how can I change it? What can I do to make it different or easier? How? That's the first thing. And when you do that, boom, that's when your first leg, the spiritual leg, connects. You connect to source. And then you start getting answers. It's amazing what starts happening. Then you get up in the morning and you start journaling and you start praying and you start meditating and you start connecting with nature and you start realizing the power, of the healing power that nature has. You start giving yourself one hour a day when you start honoring yourself, how many times don't I hear from people that are, they don't have time? They don't have time. They don't have like a, I've don't, if you tell me, if you want to come to me for healing and you say you don't have time for yourself, then don't come to me. Yeah. Simple as that. You make the time. Exactly. Because you are that important. So then with, if I can, I can work with you 
very easily and we'll have results like this very, very quickly. Um, if you choose to invest in yourself because you are the most important investment you'll ever make. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And guys, I'm going to put again, I know I put in the last video, I'm going to put all of Shanti's links and website links down in the description box below because I really feel like that's a lot of what Catherine and I have been talking about with you, Shanti, and other people, like moving into this new earth, this new timeline. This is what it comes down to you fixing you. And having yeah. people like Shanti to show you the modality, keep you accountable, but you be willing to work on you. And then when you work on you, everything changes. I mean, my, uh, after I went through my trauma therapy and then I went and spent a long time in India, that trip was really long. And, it, and I did it on purpose because there was nowhere for me to run. I had to sit literally in sometimes cow shit, <laughs> my own shit, you know, like just depends on what with Catherine David Etchie, but in India, it's everywhere too. And, and literally had to have like a total, like dark night of the soul, come to Jesus moment, come to Krishna moment, come to, you know, Ganesha yeah. moment. And it was the most, when I left after being that, that trip was so long when I left India that time I came back to the United States a different person I was the calmest I had ever been at that point my life started to shift in very very positive ways I started attracting very very positive people into my life I noticed the changes of, of friends um it was it, it, and it was because and I, nothing there was no magical pill I took it just wasn't like the universe just decided to change things up for me no the universe changed things up for me because I changed myself because I fix exactly. I work on myself. And it's a constant exactly. thing, isn't it, Shanti? It's like you don't just do the work and then all of a sudden that's done. You don't have to do the work anymore. It's like a constant revisiting, constantly. It's beautiful. And it's a constant process of expansion. Yep. You know, as human beings, we are yet to expand. In other words, shine our light brighter and become more confident within our abilities to be our own bus driver we're no longer a passenger in someone else's bus we are now driving this bus so to speak so we become confident more confident we become more healthy we become nicer to be around we become more joyful we become more solution orientated you see the more i <clears throat> in my life i see so many people that have so many problems and they just love to talk about the problems i sit with Young, I mean, I'll be going somewhere, for example, and they're young, beautiful women in their 20s and 30s. And these, this, they talk about their health and how many operations, and I'm going, <sighs> you know, it's, it let's, it's, the more we focus on something, the more you're going to get it. When you're constantly talking about the health issues you have and how many operations you've had now, how many people have had cancer in your family? And you better believe you are talking yourself into that situation. So reverse, choose differently, and then focus in the direction of where you want to be and what you want in your life. It's really not that difficult, but it does take a mind shift. And yes, we do tend to default back to what we know, because obviously we are products of our environment, right? You know, and many families are, are you know, are God fearing. And I didn't come from a God fearing family. I came from a God loving family. You know, I was taught about reincarnation when I was born. I was taught about these things when I was born, you know? So yeah. for me, it wasn't about, if you did this, then God was going to punish you and you had, to, and I know that so many people have had that and that is so ingrained in their psyche, but you can uningrain it, you know, you can go back and you can choose to look at life differently. You can start thinking differently. You can start creating differently. And I see that every day I've got beautiful students and I don't even like calling them that, but, you know, clients, friends over the years, you know, and for me, Bryce, the greatest, most beautiful moment is when I sit with someone and we'll be talking and it's the first time I've seen them, for example, and they've got this horror story that 
that has happened. And I tell you, I've heard some horror stories in my life, definitely as a healer. And then I'll simply take that and I'll show them an alternative. And they go, oh, I never thought about it like that before. And I go, uh-huh. And then so they'll go, oh, now I get it. And you literally see the light in the eyes go on. And that for me is the moment that is priceless. No amount of money could ever buy that moment that I see when someone makes that turn. And it takes that moment of switching on or switching off, whichever way you choose to look at it. And then, yes, do, we, it, do they immediately zoom into their new direction? No. It takes strategies. They've got to sometimes make major life-changing decisions, you know. Sometimes it means ending a relationship or, or whatever it might be. But when that moment of truth occurs, that aha moment in the cells, they know they have the tools. And I'm there. And I'll say, well, these are the tools. And I'm not going to do it for you. No. As a good healer, I'll never tell you where to look. I mean, I, sorry, I'll never tell you what to see, but I'll tell you where to go look. And what you see is up to each individual. And then I'll say, okay, what did you find there? This I found. I said, okay, let's work with that. And then, you know, we will take it from those moments then. And it's just amazing. And that's why I say, I've had people who've been in therapy for 15 years. And they'll come to me and within three to six sessions, they've made that shift completely because I don't just work here. I work here and I work here and I show you how to take that lead and transmute it into gold. And you can't do this without loving yourself, which means you love your body. You love this vehicle that you have chosen in this life. You have chosen it. And that's a beautiful thing. No matter what it looks like, you can have one arm, a, le a leg, you can be in a wheelchair, you can, doesn't matter, you've chosen this experience and I will show you where to go and look for the, the gift in that experience, no matter what it is. You will always find the gift. And how can you not? We're all, we're all made by the same source, you know, the same, the same source that made the Rocky Mountains made you. You're beautiful. Exactly. You totally. know, you and, and you think about I think about all my friends, the people I know in my life, and I think they're all gorgeous. You know, you see the, <laughs> the light behind their eyes. And I see how funny they are. A lot of I have my best friend is hysterical, absolutely hysterical. And I see that humor and how, you know, he makes people smile. And, you know, I see how kind some of my friends are, and they, they're not trying to be kind, they just are. And so you see oh. that light just shine from people and then it hurts me when i hear them talk bad about themselves because that's not it's not who they are and so for everybody exactly. watching i really wanted to bring shot down and talk about this because again i think both of us have struggled with this i think there's a lot of people watching who have struggled with this and mm -hmm. i think we both want you to know that you're not alone this is not Definitely abnormal not. this is normal this happens but you are enough and there are ways to start course correcting that's negative self-taught. Uh, and I love what you said, you know, like you are enough. You always have been and you always will be. That is broken. a golden mantra. You definitely are enough. And if anyone tells you any different, don't listen to them, but they're probably reflecting something that you feel within yourself anyway. So understand that everyone who's being <clears throat> shitty on some level is really a reflection of you on, an, on some level too. So stop thinking th shitty thoughts about yourself, you know? Start thinking nicer thoughts. Start appreciating the little things about yourself. It is, it is every single life and every single person watching, you have purpose. You're here for a reason. If you weren't here, this would all fall apart. Like we all have a, a, a very important role to play in, in whatever timeline we're in. And so, yeah. 
absolutely. You're all badasses. Like, you know, tell yourself I'm a badass. Like I saw a meme today. It was like, I'm really tired of living through historical events. <laughs> was a meme. But I'm like, I'm like, no, cause you're here. Cause did this time because you're a badass. Like you're, you're a warrior and you're strong and your light is powerful. And, um, and exactly. so, so yeah. So start treating yourself like that badass warrior that um, has purpose. But again, guys, I'm going to leave all of Shanti's links down below. Please, please, please. She's amazing. If you, if you need uh, some guidance, if you feel like you really need someone to talk to and help you work through this stuff. Absolutely. I, Shanti has worked miracles on me. She's so freaking talented and, um, and really, really helps you in a very loving oh, way. Whoa, you're, so you're, beautiful. you're like, you're able to give tough love in a very loving way, you know? And that takes, that takes, that takes a very talented person to do that. And so <laughs> you guys, I am, I'm dead serious. All the links to Shanti are going to be down in the description box below. Everything she does, she did for me over zoom. So it is possible wherever you are in the world um, to work that out with Shanti. Cause we have the magical, magical uh, zoom here that that can uh, can be used by anybody. We just so. zoom in and zoom, zoom out. <laughs> yes, yeah, the portal we use. So, all right. Exactly. Well, I know it's getting late for you, Shanti. Thank you for uh, evening. It's middle of the day so, for us in yeah. Atlanta, Georgia. But uh, I told Shanti. I don't know if I said this on air. I might have said this off of air to you and Mornay. When this is over, I want you guys to come to America and do a tour and just do like a healing tour. Just bring oh, I'd love to. Yeah. And I love because my son was at university in, uh, in at Life University. Um, Here in Georgia? Yeah. In Georgia, in yeah. 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 Oh, so you've been to Atlanta. I haven't, no. He was there because it was either he wanted to come home or I was going to go there. And he always chose to come home instead. So whatever air ticket was available, he chose to come home, which was fine. But I, I've always, but somehow I've always said I will go back there. And it's amazing with you there. Um, Listen, That's where I'm going, sister. Come, I mean, Atlanta, I mean, the deep South, we're a bunch of weirdos down here. We, 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 what the saying in the deep South is we don't, we don't hide our crazy. We put it on the floor, front porch and give it sweet tea. Like, you know, this is the, this is the land of still magnolias and all sorts of, I was telling you. I love it. I want to go to Louisiana, mama. We'll go, we'll do the whole go Southeast. We'll do the whole Southeast. Yeah. And I was telling you morning about the haunted places we can go and Oh, I just lost her, guys. I just lost her. Let's see if she's going to come back in. Anyway, guys, I think her internet just went down. So that was about it for our ep episode. But if you go in the description box below and find all of Shanti's links, you can get in touch with her. Please make sure to subscribe to both of her YouTube channels. One is Aquarius Rising Africa, and the other is Solutions by Aquarius Rising Africa. Again, the Aquarius Rising Africa is the more dramatic channel um, where they go into deep dives and talk to survivors and all that kind of stuff. Whereas the solutions channel is more of the solutions and finding a healthier approach into our new timeline. All right, guys, I hope you're all having a wonderful day and I'll talk to you soon. Bye. No